I'm Hemant Mehta. And I'm Jessica Blumke. And you're listening to the podcast for FriendlyAtheist.com. You can now listen to all of our episodes and see show notes at FriendlyAtheistPodcast.com. Dr. Ryan T. Cragen is an associate professor of sociology at the University of Tampa and the author of books including What You Don't Know About Religion But Should. His latest is called How to Defeat Religion in 10 Easy Steps. So, uh, Ryan, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. All right, so let's let's toss the softball out here. <laughs> so can religion okay. be defeated? Well, that's a great question, and I think um, as, a, as a social scientist, right, mm-hmm. the way that I approach this with the book is many social scientists who study religion, they're looking at what you can do to strengthen religion. And my thought was, what if we take some of their findings and just kind of flip them on their head? And that's why I kind of was interested in writing this book, is a lot of the stuff that you find that can maybe help strengthen religions, if you invert it, you can actually also weaken religion. So in thinking about it that way, I was like, you know what? I've got 10 things that people could do, um, literally people, but also local organizations and national groups, that if they just kind of put their mind to it and focused in on this, they might be effective at weakening religion. So, and of course, those are the steps in the book. Give us, give us one example of something we could do. Sure. Uh, a very specific example, and it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive, so maybe some of your listeners will think, oh, I don't know that I like this, but <laughs> uh, is, is to syncretize things that religions control. So the example, one of the examples I give in the book is religious holidays. Yeah. Uh, right now, I think you get a lot of non-religious people, atheists, secularists, humanists, who, who are wary about celebrating something like Christmas because they think it's a very religious holiday and the Christians love this. And of course, there's the whole uh, mythical, uh, mythical war on Christmas, right? Right. But of course, most atheists, secularists, etc., know that a lot of Christmas ideas were stolen from pagans in the first place, and that basically the pagan ideas were syncretized or or incorporated into different forms of Christianity. But my thinking is, rather than fight that idea, we steal a page out of their playbook, and we just continue the process of syncretizing those ideas. So wouldn't it be wonderful, right? And not everybody's going to agree with me, but wonderful if Christmas eventually became a completely secular holiday? And we actually rewrote the words to the songs to take out all the references to Christianity. So we get to keep the awesome music that most of us grew up with. We get to keep pop stars singing those songs. But the words celebrate life for everybody instead of for a very specific subgroup of people. Very simple step would take some time to adopt but it's something that we could all do to just weaken the influence of religion in society. So Mariah Carey stays, but yes. the baby Jesus goes. Now this yes. sounds, this Bingo. is this is That's the sort awesome. of thing that like gives Bill O'Reilly nightmares. <laughs> like this is I what know. he's talking about, perfect? right? <laughs> yes, it's perfect. That's Not exactly that I'm opposed to that, right. Yeah. <laughs> but how do you make this happen? Because the problem, I mean, the argument we tend to see from atheists mm-hmm is that, no, let them have the Christian celebration of Christmas. No one's arguing that they can't have Christmas. Yeah. But Let's when it comes to, to, yeah, when it comes to, like, public uh, uh, businesses, mm-hmm. why not say happy holidays? Because we don't all celebrate it. That's a good idea. When it comes to government, you can't put up a nativity scene and nothing else because it's not just about Christians. Heaven, it sounds like you're proposing a war on Christmas. <laughs> so what I'm saying is that <laughs> what you are suggesting, Ryan, is that... We do. We're not going to like legally say you can't do that. Yeah. But you're saying, yeah, right. let us make that not as important anymore. So Christians, I don't know, don't even want it. They celebrate Christmas as we celebrate Christmas. Or in other words, do right. exactly what they think we're doing anyway, which is like exactly. taking they over already Christmas. Think we're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in in a sense, we're we're actually doing both, right? So we continue to equalize the playing field because it does alienate a number of people, but at the same time, we slowly co-opt what they're doing. We work from two fronts at the same time. Win-win. How can we lose if we take that approach? Because Christians will argue that you are ruining their religious traditions, and they'll double down and try to go even harder at it. Mm. Uh, You know, I'm sure some would try, 
But if you think about it, you know, and I, I, I love the pushback, right? Like, this is great. I love this. Um, <laughs> at, at the same time, what about their, the kids, right? The, the young people. Many of them are already less religious, but they want to keep those same uh, rituals, the same songs, the same music, but they're not really religious. So you don't have to necessarily make it confrontational. In fact, the whole key to syncretism is to do it without people realizing what it is you're doing. So we don't necessarily have to make a big splashy show of it and Mm -hmm. say, hey, look, we rewrote all their songs, and now they're a thousand times better and they're relevant for all of us. We just slowly start releasing new versions of songs that take the words out. And after the first five hit, and sure, they're going to make media attention, like everybody's going to be freaking out because... Silent Night no longer yeah, has you can't You Jesus. can't change Silent Night and no one's going to notice. <laughs> like, yeah, you can take oh, sure. Silent Night away from me on my that, cool dead but hands. But after we do that once or twice, then who's going to notice when you hit some of the other songs? <laughs> you I'm sound very sneaky when you say this, yeah. which is kind of entertaining. Oh, I know. Isn't it great? It's <laughs> I know. Sneaky, I'm, but that's I'm, the whole point. I'm down for like 99% of this, but I really love Christmas music and I'm not sure if I could deal with like even with the Jesus even stuff with, especially and, yeah. with the Jesus the more <laughs> Jesus the more I like it I don't know why I just love it so much it's very strange well, I, I do too I, I don't mean, know it's one of those big, I think it's one of those big secrets that most atheists have right that come the day after Thanksgiving guess what I turn on I turn on <laughs> I love it yeah because I grew up with it I love it mm-hmm. but I would love it even more if there was really good Christmas music that was completely secular and wasn't necessarily making fun of religious people, right? Because there right. has been some attempts to, like, rewrite stuff, but it's all mocking of religious people. And I think that's the wrong approach to take. Mm-hmm. Instead, we just co-opt it. We <laughs> co-opt that music, and then I can listen to the same song forever and not feel in any twings, you know, twinges of guilt that I'm actually in some way oddly, strangely supporting a religious holiday. So basically, due to Christians, what they already did to pagans— Yes. I don't know exactly. the I don't know the answer to this. How long did it take bef- between like when the pagans did all this stuff and the Christians co-opted it? How long was that transition? Well, I mean, so you know, there was at some point when they kind of made a transition, but a lot of times it was just slowly implemented, sometimes very intentionally. Sometimes I mean, we literally have records of Catholic priests saying, "You know what? When you move over there, they do this. Why don't you just twist the meaning of that. Yeah. So we know they did it. But often it took a long, long time. I'm not thinking, you know, this is all going to be done by next Christmas. That's not going to happen. <laughs> but if we if we slowly implement this over the next 10 years, 15 years, then we just ease it in hmm. and they won't even realize what's happening. So basically, so one example would be, you know, uh, if we are parents and we're celebrating the holidays with our kids, we keep it kind of a secular holiday uh, and if more people kind of did that, that when these kids grow up, they think of Christmas as a secular holiday. Oh, shit, I'm nailing this already. And yeah, and like the Jesus <laughs> part doesn't even come into play, really. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here's an argument uh, I feel you might get, like, which is if you're saying how to defeat religion in 10 steps, wouldn't one of the right. steps just be waited out? Because <laughs> religion already seems to be becoming less popular for a number of reasons. We always hear these studies about how the nuns are on the rise. People are becoming more non-religious than ever before. Uh, Is that one of the solutions? Just like, just wait till the old people die off and then it'll become less powerful over time. Religion. Sure. And, and absolutely. I mean, I, as a social scientist, one of the theoretical perspectives I take is that secularization is occurring. So I absolutely agree that like that seems to be working. But my counter argument is, wouldn't it be useful and nice to speed up the process a little bit, even if it's even if it's by one percent or ideally five percent, ten percent, then we just get there that much faster. So and if there's some very specific things we can do. Why not try them? Yeah. Sure. So. Um... I want to talk a little bit about um, the fact that you calculated the cost of religious tax exemptions in the U.S., and you found that it comes out to $71 billion. Um, How does one go about doing that kind of math? (laughs) It's a great question. Uh, So there's like a really long version. Basically, I had some students in my sociology religion class who were interested (laughs) in, in the finances of religion, and they actually posed some questions that I didn't know, which is like, what kind of tax breaks do they get? So we turned it into a semester-long independent study, and we spent a semester reading tax law, which 
I would not wish on anybody, but we did that (laughs) and figured out uh, as many of the tax breaks that that, um, they get. And then we made some assumptions, right? So people always have to keep in mind that this, this calculation is based on some assumptions. So one, we actually have a solid number for how much money religions get every year through donations. Um, uh, it's, it's a little bit problematic because it's just the donations. It's not all of the money that they earn with all of their nonprofit and for-profit businesses, which mm. is a whole different uh, thing, which we didn't calculate. There's about $101 billion every year is what they're donated, right? So religions get that. So working off of that assumption, and then we said, okay, what if we treat religions like for-profit corporations? And that's another assumption that not everybody's going to agree with, right? But that's the basis of that calculation, and we say, all right, what are some of these tax exemptions that religions receive? So obviously there's the first one, which they pay no income tax, so they don't pay any taxes on the money that they receive as donations. And then, of course, there's the tax write-off for those people who are donating. And then you've got they pay no property taxes, they pay no sales taxes. Um, they get a number of other exemptions, including a parsonage exemption, which is for clergy, uh, they pay no unemployment taxes. And as you start to kind of tally all of these things, what you can do is you can say, well, all right, let's estimate how much property there is owned by religions in the U.S. And if they're not paying any property taxes, what would that translate into if we use an average price for that piece of property? If religions were paying a standard uh, corporate tax rate at the federal level, at the state level, and at the local level, what would that translate into in terms of taxes? So you just kind of slowly work all those numbers up, and as you add them all together, the total that I came up with was eventually $71 billion, which I think is actually a very conservative estimate mm-hmm. um, because we, we left out a number of things. We had no way of calculating, actually, how much we lose through the write-offs that people get when they donate to religions. We just could not estimate that. We didn't know how much religions were saving in sales tax. We didn't know how much they were saving in unemployment taxes. So we actually didn't know a number of things, but we still came up with that estimate. So seventy one billion dollars is the is lowballing it. It's probably high. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And in fact I found out it was like a month after that article came out in Free Inquiry, um, which is where we published that article. I found out that the Catholic Church in the U.S. alone, uh, it was in The Economist, they estimated that they were spending, the Catholic Church alone, were spending close to $150 billion a year, which, if you think about that, I was saying all religions in the U.S. only get $101 billion. So how could it possibly be the case that the Catholic Church is spending $150 billion? Mm -hmm. Clearly, they've got a lot more revenue than we even know about. It's like they have a secret vault or something. (laughs) Yeah. Well, yeah, they have a lot of for-profit businesses and non-profit businesses, which don't get donations. So because they have that extra revenue, we couldn't estimate that because they don't have to report that, right? That's the beauty of our tax law is that religions don't have to file any accounting of their income to the IRS. They, they, they get away scot-free on that. Yeah. I, I heard a story a while ago that uh, Professor Jared Diamond, who wrote Guns, Germs, and Steel, mm-hmm. he wrote a book called Collapse about how different societies kind of emerge and they're powerful and then uh, they just go away for various right. reasons. And I remember, I think the story I heard was that, you know, he has all these chapters about the different types of societies that end up collapsing. And he taught a class for like a semester where he talks about what he ended up talking about in chapter one. Like, here is this story. Mm -hmm. And he would explain it to the students and he would get their feedback and they would question him about the things he was saying. And that helped shape shape the ultimate chapter that was in his book. And he did this for like a full semester. It made his book more comprehensive. He kind of was able to anticipate the rebuttals a lot easier. I wonder if as a professor, you ever get the chance to do that with books like this one where you might say like, okay, students, here's the, here's the theory I have. Uh, Let's talk about why we need to secularize these religious holidays. And I wonder if you can have these debates with students where they tell you why that's a dumb idea or that's a great idea. And (laughs) If you have a chance right. to bounce these off of them at all, because, I mean, I would think that's an advantage you might be able to get that someone who doesn't mm-hmm. teach uh, might not. Right. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great point. In fact, in the book, uh, so I've done similar things, right? I do teach a class on sociology and religion where I run a lot of these ideas by the student. Um, but I also will use my students sometimes. I don't mean that in like, like bad sense, right? But I'll use my students to help me gather data. Um, and in fact, in the book, we have a number of charts. So there's one 
uh, it was just this weird question that I had, right? So this is another thing that I have as an advantage being a college professor where I have easy access to students. If I was just interested in this question, like, if I made students, religious students, so these are self-identified religious students, if I made them choose between going to church on their holy day, I tried to specify, it could be another day, it doesn't have to be Sunday, and other activities, which would they actually prefer, right? And I kind of built into it some assumptions, like, okay, let's pretend that you would donate $20 if you went to church, or you'd spend $20 on whatever the activity was. And then I gave them a bunch of forced choices, right? So it's like, you can either go to church, or you can go to a bar. You can go to church, or you can play video games. You can go to church, or you can go to the beach. I live in Florida, so you, know, you can go to the beach. So I gave them all these choices. The amazing thing is, uh, my students, uh, I gave them like 15 different choices. They opted to do anything but go to church, <laughs> with the exception of watch TV, right? So they would rather go to church than watch TV. That was, that was one of them. There was like two others. But on everything else, they'd rather go to a bar. They'd rather go to almost anything than go to church, which tells me, right, that we're missing an opportunity. We being collectively corporate America who wants to make money, right? Mm -hmm. We're missing an opportunity if we're not offering other alternatives for our students. So that's one example where... I have that access of, like, I can very quickly say, I've got this weird idea. I'm just going to run it by my students and see what I get. And it turns out I have pretty good data suggesting that religious college students would rather do almost anything yeah. than go to church. Anything active, it seems. Because, like, mm -hmm. church is kind of like a TV show anyway. You're just passively watching it. It's a terrible it. TV show. It's a terrible yeah. TV show. Exactly. Depending on where get you go. Get Netflix, guys. <laughs> They'd rather spend time with their pet than go to church. Which I think is great. That's adorable. So, um, so your previous book was um, what you don't know about don't know about religion, but should. Who was your audience for mm -hmm. that book? Are you looking to reach out to atheists like haven't mean like hey you didn't know this about that, or are you looking for like religious people but like hey your church is costing this country billions of dollars? What you doing, buddy? Um, both really right. So I, in a sense, the they're. They're very, they're very much our two audiences. Uh, as far as like the non-religious atheists, free thinkers, et cetera, one of the things I was trying to do there, um, I often will hear um, different free thinkers, et cetera, say things that I'm like, you know, that's absolutely true, but wouldn't it be nice if you had the data to back that up? Mm. And I'm a numbers guy. I like statistics. I like, you know, data analysis, that kind of stuff. So that book, What You Don't Know About Religion But Should, is chock full of data. It's all about the statistics. So the next time you are in some discussion, ideally not a debate, right, but a discussion with somebody, and you want to actually clearly illustrate, like, hey, you know what? Non-religious people are actually more uh, egalitarian when it comes to gender attitudes or sexual orientation um, or race, right? Mm -hmm. I give you the data in the book to back that up. When you want to, you know, when you're in a discussion and you're like, oh, non-religious people are actually better educated and smarter. Yep, I have the data in the book to back that up. So that's one of them where I was like, people say these things, and wouldn't it be nice to be able to be like, here's my source. And if you don't believe it, he's given references and he's told you where the data are. You can go and actually verify it. So that was one audience where it was like, here, you've got more power to your arguments if you've got the data to back it up. The other... I mean, the odds of me actually reaching religious fundamentalists who kind of are a target of the book, um, yeah, that's not going to happen. I mean, I know <laughs> that. But uh, I'm, I'm really hoping that, like, liberally religious people, people who aren't religious fundamentalists, and maybe even some moderates would pick up, pick up that book and go, oh, you know, that's, like, he's got some good points here. That, you know, I don't have to give up my religion, but being non-religious doesn't make you a bad person. Because I show that pretty compellingly in the book. There's no difference in happiness rates between religious and non-religious people. There's no difference in health. Um, being religious isn't going to make you healthier or happier. Non-religious people are just as healthy as happy. So why do you kind of continue to insist that you need to be religious? There's, there's no necessarily benefit to being religious, and the data back that up. Let me so those put are the... kind of the two audiences. Let me put the shoe on the other foot for a second. You're giving all these ways for people to defeat religion. If you are the Christian church right now, 
um, certain things seem kind of out of your control right now. The changing demographics uh, in support of LGBT right. rights, things like that. How do you stop the onslaught of, you know, changing culture and all these demographic shifts? Is there anything you can do to kind of prevent it? Uh, yes, and it's super scary because to what extent they're actually doing it, we don't really know. Um, here's, if I were, if I were on that side, yeah. uh, who listens to your podcast? Uh, Only you fundamentalist Christians, Christians uh-huh. so you're giving them ammo here. <laughs> oh, and my dad. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so here's what I would do, and I don't think that, I, I, I honestly think some of them may be thinking about this. We try and destroy the middle class. Um, and I know that sounds like completely tangential and unrelated. We, the church, the try to destroy the middle class? Yes. Okay. The church tries to destroy the middle class. Here's why. Yeah. When people have a sense of existential security, that's the term that was used by uh, Norris and Engelhardt in their book on, on this topic. When they don't have that sense of security in their lives, when they don't know that they're going to get food, that they don't have guaranteed housing, they don't have a guaranteed retirement, they don't have Medicare, they don't have Medicaid, they don't have Social Security. When they don't have that sense of security, they turn to religion for it. And they found that pretty compellingly internationally, right? If you look at international data, the countries that have the lowest levels of religiosity are also the countries that have the highest level of social safety net, that people actually feel secure in their everyday, ordinary lives. So if you want to ruin that, if you want to get people back into church, destroy their social safety net. And there is an ongoing effort by conservatives, I'm trying to remain party neutral here, but by (laughs) conservatives to actually weaken the social safety net. If we can get rid of the social safety net, let's undo Obamacare, right? Mm -hmm. We do that. And we weaken people's relying, you know, their social safety net. If we they can't get doctors, class, so they got to rely on their faith to get them through. Exactly. So if we undermine that, we actually push people back to church. That's so And evil. there are some who actually know that. So if I were on the religion side, I would be pushing very strongly against um, entitlements is their term, right? Entitlement. Sure. Um, because those entitlements are basically what are helping people get out of religion. I think that's really interesting because I've heard, you know, I think we've all, anybody who is following like secular or anything knows those statistics of like, you know, increased religiosity follows, you know, and, and uh, lower income, lower education all go together. I guess I'd always right. understood it like it's kind of a chicken egg situation, right? Like mm-hmm. are, are people who are poor turning to religion or are... Know, People what's, who what's are the religion other? more likely thing. to be poor or something right, like that. Right, 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 right. So right. I, I've never heard it put that way before. That if we just eliminate the mm-hmm. middle class, then people are more likely to cling to religion in uh-huh. a sense. And that is one way the church yeah. could get more powerful. That's really interesting. There you go. That's so horribly evil. Oh, my God. <laughs> clever. Well, I mean, I, I know. Like, I, I feel conflicted saying that. You, you told me, you know, your <laughs> no, audience is no, mostly no. fundamentalist Christian, so I guess we're giving away the secret. But right. at the same time, like, why deny the truth? Like, there's really compelling scientific evidence that that's actually what's happening. And it we, doesn't we just need to tell people. It's not even necessarily a thing they're going to set out to do, like, oh, if we get rid of, like, they're not thinking about it the same sociological way you are, but it may inadvertently be something that they're trying to push because they know people need religion when they kind of lose those safety nets. Like, it's not something yep. they're even thinking about, but they just kind of do it. This is, yeah. I, my yeah. mind is blown right now. I've never <laughs> heard that put that way before. Holy cow. Good. Success. Success. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> you do How, thing, Hammett. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you're teaching your classes to these students and stuff, what are some of the things you have... How long have you taught as, as a professor? I started teaching in 2007 well, after my PhD. I taught a little bit as a graduate student, but really started my job in 2007. Okay, yeah. so about seven, eight years now. Um, have you noticed any change with how your students react to issues of religion, like from when you started till now? And I know some of that goes to, you know, you just get better as a teacher. But I wonder if how they talk about religion, how they respond to things about religion has changed over time. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a great question. I guess I've been here doing this long enough to have a little bit of a sense of this. That the only thing that I think I could really say about that is what I'm sensing, and I I could be wrong on this, is a growing indifference towards religion, that when I bring it up, I mean, I try really hard to get them engaged, right? 
But increasingly, students just don't seem all that interested in religion, Mm -hmm. which is probably a manifestation of secularization. And then the other one that just blows my mind, which um, (laughs) it shouldn't. Like, I know the numbers on this, but still it's just weird, is how little they actually know about their own religions. Yeah. So I will often, you know, like raise issues like, okay, well, you know, let's use the Catholic Church for an example. So what's the Catholic Church's teaching on X, right? Who are my Catholics in here? And I'll get, you know, 10 students who raise their hands and like, okay, what does the Catholic Church teach on this? And it's just <laughs> they have no idea. Theirs. They don't know. And so I have to actually, like, teach them, well, here's what your religion is about. <laughs> here's like, what you believe. What believe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, it, it's amazing to me that they literally have, like, no idea, even though they've been raised in this. Many of them have been through all of their, you know, sacraments and everything. They, they, they're, you know... They did communion, they got baptized and everything, and they still don't know what it's all about. (laughs) You mean Jesus is a wafer? What? (laughs) (laughs) Come on now. They they have no idea. (laughs) So so that one I think is just fascinating, right? Like, they don't care, and they don't know. And it's pretty unusual to actually get a student these days. Uh, And it could be my, my particular student body. I've got a body who gets more religious fundamentalists, and sometimes they'll go at it with him. But it's pretty rare that a student will be like, hey, I've got a different perspective on that. Because usually they have no clue. Yeah. So when I start educating them, they're just like, wow. No one's saying to you, no, I'm Catholic. I know Catholicism and you're wrong about that. They really just, I'm Catholic, but I don't really know what that means. But do you think that's that's a result of they were never taught that or they're just sort of choosing to only hold on to the things that make sense to them? I guess that's impossible Um, for you to say. I guess it's sort of... I no, no, I, I think you're on the right track. I think what it is, is uh, every successive generation in the U.S. is less religious, right? right? Um, so if you go back to your grandparents, your grandparents were fairly religious. And in fact, for many of my students, that's often what the situation is, is that their grandparents are actually pretty religious. So whenever they go to visit the grandparents, they kind of have to go to church. Yeah, they right? turn on the religious but switch. Yeah, but their parents were like, eh, when mom and, you know, when mom and dad are around, we'll go to church. And, yeah, we'll send you to Sunday school, right? We'll, we'll send you for communion or whatever. But honestly, we don't really care that much either. Right. So it's not so much that, like, they were steeped in this by their parents. It's their parents were moderately religious. Yeah. But when you've got moderately religious parents, what are the kids going to be? Yeah, you know. I did some stuff for them, but honestly, I didn't care. I mean, I was I w- more interested than in whatever. I was baptized. My brother and I were both baptized. Literally, my dad has told me, you're baptized so your grandmother would leave me the hell alone. <laughs> that is why exactly. I was baptized. And so I guess I'm Catholic, question yeah. mark? <laughs> and I, I think that's really common these days is that if we go back just one generation, right, to our parents, um, yeah, they're just not that interested, right? Yeah. They're doing it. Some some clearly are. I mean, don't get me wrong. Obviously, there's still a lot of religious people, but but the level of interest has declined pretty dramatically. And then we look at the kids and like, yeah, they're really not interested. Well, is it a pendulum swing or is it linear? Like if you, yeah, you go back to Ooh. say Hemmets and my grandparents. Yeah, maybe they were more religious because right. we're about the same age. But what about their parents and their parents? Were they super, yeah. super religious um, or were they not that religious? They're liberal and, and it kind of yeah. swung. Pendulum yeah. style. Uh, so this is this is a great question. Um, it's actually one that has been debated and continues to be debated to some degree among sociologists of religion. So basically, going back to the 1990s through about the last five years, uh, there was a big debate uh, as to whether religion is cyclical. So you basically get these periods of like high levels of religiosity and then they decline a little bit and then they cycle back up yeah. or whether religiosity is actually linear. And so the decline is linear over time. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean necessarily linear is like it's perfectly straight. It can hit bumps. It can hit slight reversals, but the general trend is toward decline. Yeah. Um, the current evidence, in my opinion, and there are certainly sociologists who would disagree with me, though I think they're now a minority in the field and they're losing this battle because the evidence is just not so that side to them is that it is more linear. Uh, we don't see it really cycle. Um, with that said, you want a little kind of historical tidbit of information that's kind of weird, but Bring requires it. a little explaining? <laughs> Bring okay. it. Love tidbits. So if we go back to the early days of the United States, 
Okay, and again, I'm trying to be sensitive here. Obviously, there were people here before the Europeans, but sure. early days of the United States, fewer people were um, members of religions than was the case, say, in the 1950s. What we actually saw, and there's a book called The Churching of America, right? But what we actually saw is a lot of people actually weren't affiliated with religions or didn't belong to a specific congregation. And part of that was a lot of people lived in the frontier. So basically, you'd have people go out into the frontier, right, so that they're moving west. As they would, you know, set up frontier towns, religions weren't always right there. So basically, you have lots of people who are, quote-unquote, unchurched. I hate that term, but that's the term they (laughs) use. Uh, They were unchurched, and it took a while for the churches to basically catch up to the settlements headed west. So what you actually see, and this is why I said it's nuanced, it's kind of a fun little historical tidbit, is as we move west, more and more people actually end up joining churches. So we get the Churching of America from about 1776 to the 1950s. Religious affiliation is on the rise. Since the 1950s, it's been going down. But here's the tricky part, right? So some people have tried to argue, oh, see, that means that it's not secularization, it's not declining, it's actually on the rise, it can cycle through. No, you've got to factor in something else. So religiosity is more than just religious affiliation. It's your beliefs. It's your behaviors. It's what you're doing that is related to the supernatural. So if we go back to the early U.S., right, 1700s, 1800s, the stuff they were doing would blow our minds, right? I'll just use one example, and I hope I'm not taking too much time. I think this is just really interesting stuff. Uh, Joseph Smith, so I've got my background in Mormonism, right? But Joseph Smith, he was born in 1805, so he's born during this time period. He used to practice magic, right? Um, magic? He would do treasure seeking. He did mm-hmm. all sorts of fascinating things. He believed in folk magic because it was pervasive. Even though not everybody belonged to a church, they believed very heavily in supernatural influence in the world. So, yeah, okay, there was the churching of America as people joined Christian churches, But it doesn't mean that nobody believed in all sorts of supernatural things like folk magic and God and read the Bible and other things. They just didn't have churches that they could go to. Those supernatural beliefs have declined over time as well. So really, it is linear. It is declining, even if you see some counter trends that seem a little bit, to call that into question, Mm -hmm. most of the evidence seems to suggest, no, we're headed in a downward trajectory. Religion is on a decline. Does that make sense? Sorry, that was long, but I think it's really fine. No, that's fine. I just, I feel like the question everybody has in their minds is, are Hemmings and my grandchildren going to be like (laughs) Baptists? Is really, I think, what everybody wants to know. Uh, Well, if we see a cataclysmic, like, apocalyptic disaster, and uh, there is no social safety net, I I would not make any bets in that situation. (laughs) Shit. (laughs) I won't. But, I have a. This is an issue that oh, I feel. I was just going to say, if yeah, if that doesn't happen and we continue down our development trajectory, your kids are ninety nine percent likely to be atheists. Woo! Hey. Good job, there Evan. You go. We're You're this. welcome, future me. <laughs> there you go. Um, this is a question I feel might be a sociological issue as we go down, like a generation or two down the line, with the secularization. Uh, of America, I guess, you are seeing more mm-hmm. people having children, but the parents are not religious anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they were never really religious to begin with. Mm-hmm. And now we start right. having more second, third generation atheists uh, who are just, mm-hmm. who are being raised without religion. Right. Um, and I don't right. know if you've uh, been teaching long enough to notice this or what, but I wonder what's going to happen with those kids. Are they going to be raised like some of the students you're mentioning who just have no knowledge really of what these religious beliefs oh, are, or are they just going to be right. like, uh, yeah, I, or are they going to have knowledge of, Oh, this is what these people believe. This is what these people believe. I don't believe any of it. You know, but you're I, what are they going to be you're socially aware, but they're socially aware of it. Yeah. yeah. What's going to happen with mm-hmm. these kids who are being raised outside of religious homes? Right. That, I think it's a great question. So, uh, there are a couple of ways to think about it. Uh, again, this is me being a little bit nuanced. But uh, right now, in the U.S., because we do remain a fairly religious and pro-religious country, right, that it's, relig- it's normative to be religious, I think a lot of those kids born now and probably in the next 15 to 20 years are still going to have to be fairly knowledgeable about religion yeah. because they're going to have to defend their secularism. If that makes sense. And you right? have to know what so you're kind of have... fighting against. 
Yes. They're going to have to know because people are going to challenge them. Um, I think that's on the decline, right? <laughs> increasingly, it's okay, particularly if you identify as just non-religious. Like, ah, I don't go to church. People yeah. are increasingly like, eh, whatever, fine. Right. Yeah. If you identify as an atheist, then they're going to go after you, right? Atheists are still highly distrusted and considered immoral, and there are all sorts of issues there. But increasingly, non-religion is like, fine, that's fine. So I don't think people are going to have to, 15, 20 years down the road, they're probably not going to have to know much about it. They're not going to have to defend it to anybody. It's basically just going to be widely accepted, unless you're in maybe really rural parts sure. of Alabama or something. I mean, I would argue um, right now that's kind but, of the case. Yeah. Depending well, what I would live. say is, anyway. um, if, if we can look to Western Europe as an illustration of where we might be in 15, 20 years, many of the people in Western Europe, now that most of the country is non-religious, right? Like most of the, most of the society is basically just, they don't, they're they not don't religious. Care. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They don't care. What you get is religious indifference. So it's not like firebrand David Silverman atheism where they just hate religion. They just don't care. Religion is so yeah. irrelevant in their lives. It doesn't matter. Um, Bill Zuckerman's work basically in Denmark, he looked at this. He had a hard time even getting them to talk about religion. Right. And often when you would ask them, you know, the first question, it's like, so, you know, what do you think about religion? They'd say, I, I'm not interested in that topic. <laughs> I right? don't. Like, I don't want yeah. to talk about it. <laughs> oh, my God, yeah. yeah. And that's what it is. Like, they're just indifferent. It's and we get these so comments all the time on the podcast, on the blog, too, where people are like, man, I— the people from Europe will comment and say things like, I can't believe you got to deal with all this, <laughs> this shit. This sucks, guys. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I can't believe you right. got to put up with all this because I don't have to put up with it ever yeah, where I'm from. Yeah. That's fascinating. And I think that's, yeah, 15, 20 years from now in the U.S., that's what you're going to get. Because people are going to be like, hey, whatever. Yeah. You know, the <laughs> religion is now a minority, right? I mean, we'll see if it's a minority at that point. But, but, it's perfectly fine to be non-religious and nobody even cares anymore. That's like the least no. exciting rally cry. Like the future of religion is <laughs> meh. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. No, that's, I mean, that's great if it happens. I, that's that's awesome. So uh, thank you again uh, to Dr. Ryan Cragen. His book is called How to Defeat Religion in 10 Easy Steps. And we'll post a link to that in the show notes. Thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to the podcast for FriendlyAtheist.com. This episode was taped at Cinnamon Sound Studios in Aurora, Illinois, and the music was written and performed by Brad Chagdis. If you like what you're hearing, please consider making a contribution at Patreon.com slash Hemant. That's he T. We appreciate your support. I'm Hemant Mehta. And I'm Jessica Blumke. We hope you'll join us next time.